Welcome, everyone, to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I'm your host, Ray Harkins, and we're at episode number 55. And the guest this week is none other than hip-hop artist extraordinaire, P.O.S. More on him in a minute. Let's get some shit out of the way and or business. Propertyofzack.com. Visit them. Find out the latest and greatest in all of your favorite bands, releases, tours, Everything you could possibly want is all contained there. Check out the site. We, I, love them. You should visit them. Also, special, special shout out. And thank you so much to everybody who, a few episodes ago, I started a little campaign saying email the AV Club. And if you're not familiar with the AV Club, it's an absolutely spectacular website that covers television, movies, podcasts, everything you could want in pop culture. Anyways, they do a review, a weekly roundup of podcasts, and uh, I just had this goal that I wanted this podcast to be featured on there. And so many of you kind people did that. I bugged my friends, and I apologize, but that was just something I felt very strongly about. And we got it. We got a nice little write-up, and it honestly it exposed the show to a whole new audience of people. And if you are just joining us from that, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I hope you continue to enjoy the content. So, uh, yes, thank you, everybody that wrote in. Thank you, everybody that contributed in some fashion to that. I do appreciate it. Go to the website, 100wordspodcast.com. If you're feeling ever so generous, drop a review on iTunes. Five stars, four stars, whatever you feel the show is worth. Uh, We're getting dangerously close. We have like 90 or so star reviews on iTunes. I I want to get to 100. And if you haven't done it yet, just just go ahead. Two seconds. That's all it takes. We have over 100 worldwide, but you know we only see the states here in the states as far as the reviews are concerned. So that's, that's the business out of the way. I would be remiss if I did not say something in regards to uh, a music festival that I run uh, alongside one of my good friends, Joey Cahill. I'm not going to go into too much detail because, uh, yeah, that'll be for another time, another place, much farther on down the line. But uh, the festival is canceled this year the 2013 edition of Sound and Fury. And I'm sure most of you have read about that on the internet by this point because this is like two weeks old now. It was a very difficult decision to come to. It sucks. And uh, I feel bad for everybody that is obviously bummed out about that and really wants the festival to happen because at the end of the day, that's what I would have wanted as well. So that's that. Uh, You can read a full statement at soundandfuryfest.com. Yeah, thanks to anybody that... uh, cares about that whole thing anyways on to more exciting and brighter things pos i don't even know where to begin i've been a huge fan of him uh for quite some time i've actually never had the pleasure of seeing him live in a club i saw him at warp tour but i never had the you know like i said privilege of watching him perform on tour but uh, i'm going to change that when he's able to get back on the road yeah he is part of the whole sort of indie hip-hop scene Uh, for those of you who have never heard of him before. But his own roots uh, definitely lie, which you will find out in the interview, within the kind of punk and hardcore scene. And because of that, and because that informs the art that he's creating now, it's pretty incredible. And it's a very unique take on what is happening with not only within hip-hop, but it is also happening within independent culture. It's just a pretty impressive thing. And when I made a list of people that I wanted to interview for this show... He was near the top uh, just because I think he's got a lot of interesting things to say. And more recently, the past year, he's been battling a lot of health issues, and we talk about that in the interview. So yeah, I was just incredibly excited to do it, and I was stoked that he wanted to do it um, because I contacted him through his publicist and got it all set up, and him and I were texting for a course of like two weeks trying to schedule this, and we finally were able to connect. I think even if you have no desire to check him out as a musician... I think the interview will change your mind about that uh, because he has some pretty compelling things to say. Here's my interview with POS. I will talk to you after. Hey, my whole crew's on some shit. Scuffing up your Nikes, spitting on your whip. Kicking out your DJ, rock it, then we dip. We don't watch the replay. Hey, 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 crew. My whole crew's on some shit. Scuffing up your Nikes. I mean, the simplest place to start is obviously like you know, born and raised. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been uh, I've been in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities for ever. Yeah, <laughs> I only played maybe like two or three shows there when I was touring in bands. It was such a well, thank you. 
Uh, I played in a band called Taken. Uh, we were around from like 97 till about 2004. Just kind of like the whole sort of melodic, hardcore, metalcore type stuff. Like playing shows up there was always really cool. Like it had such a vibrant sort of, I don't know, it's just, it felt different than like any, like most of other shows that I would play like in the Midwest. And it's like such a, uh, a tighter community, I guess maybe just because there's maybe less people to pull. I don't know if you noticed that. Maybe, but it's also, <laughs> if you had 200 people at your show, chances are 150 of those people were in a band themselves. Yeah. You know, like it's just it's just one of those scenes where you can't throw a rock without hitting a rapper or hitting a bass player. It's 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 a music city. It always has been before the big punk wave that you're talking about. Yeah. There was a, you know, the the Minneapolis sound was a thing with uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and Prince and yeah, all this stuff. Yeah, it's always been one of those cities where if if you can't get in a club, you can definitely find a basement. If you can't find a basement, you can definitely find a coffee shop. You know, like there's always something here. Yeah, there's always a a venue that was open. And so, what was your family structure like when you were growing up? Just me and my mom, actually. Um, okay. My, my mom had a boyfriend for some of my earlier years, like second grade to sixth grade. She had a boyfriend that we lived with, and he had a son, so I had kind of like a stepbrother. Oh, okay. But aside from that, it was the rest of it. It's just been me and my mom. I don't think I ever worried about that. I didn't really think about, you know, a lot of people are bummed out with their dad's gone or all that stuff like that. And I don't think I realized that you were supposed to have a dad until way later. Right. I just wasn't paying attention. I, I think a lot of that has to do with the context in which you were raised, where it's like, you know, if it if it's normal that your father isn't there, you only know that it's not normal when someone else is like, like, where's, yeah, where's your dad? <laughs> <laughs> right. You're like, what do you mean? Yeah. It's and like, my, my dad was around probably until I was five, right in that area. But definitely all of my like real formative action years, you know, just me. What did uh, what did your mom do? Because obviously, being a single mom is is not an easy task. She gave up being an artist, <laughs> like a painter. Oh, really? To become a word processing specialist at a consultant firm. Okay. Which I don't know what that breaks down to. What her actual actual job is? Right. I know that. <laughs> That's the title. <laughs> she's, she's moved through that company, the same company, for most of my life, and in the last. 10 years she's found a lot of happiness with her with her husband and mm. lots of singing and her and her husband and uh a lot of pe- people in my family go to old folks homes and sing and put on little concerts and stuff like that oh sure little productions and stuff that's cool well yeah she's so she was able to kind of circle back to her passions and be able to give back in a way yeah absolutely that's awesome and my dad was a saxophone player in a funk band and then he took off like when I went. Like, the last I remember of him is he took off to Las Vegas to be in his funk band. I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. That uh, going going to Vegas to be in a funk band that sounds like that can swallow you up immediately. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he's just he's just gone at that point. Um, he was a uh, by all accounts from everybody in my family. He was a really great dad, mm-hmm. and then just got swallowed up in crack and things like that. I presume you didn't obviously learn about that until much much later. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple experiences that I remember where he would like hide something in my pocket if cops were coming and something like that. Whoa. But I never really knew what it was until, you know, I, I remember taking it out of my pocket and looking at it and not really having any clue what it was until, you know, I was a teenager and <laughs> thinking back on it. Yeah, yeah. The concept of being a father and how you, you know, how the littlest of things can obviously have such yeah. an impact where it's like, yeah, he's putting crack in your kid's pocket like that's that's not not advisable in general but yeah just that those little things can stick out and True. just be like oh yeah like that was pretty fucked up that that happened and so as you were you know like like you said your formative years mm-hmm. like once you know you started to kind of enter you know junior high high school and that type of stuff uh what sort of kid what sort of kid did you find yourself being um you know were you uh what were you into i think it punk rock happened super early for me i know that my, my mom met that guy that i was telling you about mm-hmm. and we moved into his house, so I moved to the suburbs, which was cool, but it was also like, you know, there was very few black people around. Some of the black people around were, you know, a couple of them were like adopted and raised by like white Jewish families, and they were different from all the people I had grown up with. So mm. I found punk rock kind of because I was, you know, by myself riding a skateboard around, and then you end up finding the people who also skateboard, mm. you know, <laughs> and then they give you tapes. You meet older people, they give you music. That's awesome. That's kind of where that all came from. Um, How old were you when that was kind of starting to enter your life? Sixth, sixth grade. 
That is pretty early. Sixth grade, I got I got some black flag and some minor threat, and then around seventh grade, I uh, I got uh, it's kind of like a grab bag with uh, Punk and Drublick and uh, the first Rancid record. Oh, great! And kind of tied all that stuff together, and kind of it was just me from then, you know. Yeah. I, I I was really just into music. I think that was all I was really into: music and girls. Eventually. Right. <laughs> And that's pretty much been my, my primary focus of my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are two great priorities as far as I'm concerned. Uh, obviously, you grew up in an artistic household. Like, you know, was music, like, did your mom expose you to certain things? Or was it one of those things that you were obviously just kind of, you know, on your own and your mom listened to the radio where she did? And I think before I found my own music, I was very interested in listening to what my mom listened to. Lots of Michael Jackson, lots of pop, um, lots of funk and soul, mm-hmm. um, Motown. And then my mom. My mom can get into country, but I can't get into country. She can get into because she likes to sing. So anything that she enjoys singing along with, she will. But yeah, it was always music playing in the house. Mm-hmm. And uh, the um, you know, a stereotypical black teenager that doesn't get introduced to punk and hardcore like that. Just that's not it's true. <laughs> especially especially back then. I mean, when I was <laughs> yeah, when I was when I was uh, first getting into it, I remember getting into high school and having people. Some of some of the, the more traditional styled black kids giving me a lot of shit for how I look and how I dressed and mm-hmm. not really understanding. You know, being being in the suburbs, being uh one of very few people that looked like me, it was it was really easy and quick to grab onto that punk rock aesthetic like right away. Right. You know, I had a blue mohawk and started getting tattoos when I was fourteen and you know, like <laughs> <laughs> like I looked like a straight up maniac, you know. And and looking back on it, it was probably a lot of defense. If you're gonna follow me around your store, I might as well actually look like a threat, you know. Right, right. You're like, if you yeah, if you feel threatened, I will completely fall into that mold. Exactly, but not in the in the, in the gangster way, right? Because I I couldn't really relate with that either, you know. Right, right. Once you started to kind of you know do that, and parents would probably view that as acting out. Like, how did, how did your mom react to all that? Oh man, now she was pretty supportive. That's amazing. <laughs> I had a really super awesome mom, and it was just me and her. And mm-hmm. maybe there was some guilt that it was just me and her. Mm-hmm. Like she was really supportive. She pretty much let me do whatever. She was the first person to tell me never get a job. <laughs> really? That's an, yeah. <laughs> that's an amazing yeah. piece of advice. Uh, Don't get a job. Yeah. She was like, find something that you like to do and do it. You know, you might end up in a very small place or less stuff than everybody around you, but you'll at least enjoy what you do with your time. You know. Yeah. And she definitely instilled uh, uh, the idea in me that success is completely in the eyes of the user. Yeah. The whole idea of obviously keeping up with the Joneses and feeling like you have to do what others define as being successful. Like, no, you can just forge your own path. That's awesome that your mom was like, yeah, this is important. (laughs) Yeah, right off the bat, right off the bat, you know. Right. Um, She, I think in maybe fifth or sixth grade, I watched a Guns N' Roses video for Paradise City, the one where they, the the show, they set up a show by, yeah, it's like a time lapse of a a football field and it fills up and then... right. And I think it was watching that video is when I realized that music was a job, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, and I think from that point, it was just, that's what I'm going to do. And then I taught myself how to play bass on my cousin's bass. Me, I started some bands with some friends, uh, pretty much sixth grade, seventh grade, uh-huh. learned how to play guitar, learned how to play drums. And then that was pretty much what I was doing. I was playing shows, you know, in the city by the time I was... 13, 14. Wow. That's I went on my first tour when I was 14. Right. And you, you were obviously like, you just kind of picked it up and it was all self-taught. You just played, played, yeah, played bar chords totally. and figured it out. Yep. And I eventually, uh, took, took some bass lessons from a guy at a music shop and I refused to use my pinky because I already taught myself without my pinky mm-hmm. and then he, he didn't want to teach me anymore. Right. <laughs> He's like, fuck that. <laughs> But I wish I would have stuck with it because, you know, now I'm way more interested in actually being able to shred well instead of just kind of blues out. <laughs> I'm trying to teach myself how to use my pinky these days. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's cool that you were you were trying to be so multi-instrumental because usually it's like, you know, a person kind of figures like, all right, I'll do guitar and that's kind of my thing. Maybe. I don't, I don't know, man. I think that video games weren't as good then, you know, so I was just trying to try everything. It wasn't a matter of I want to do everything. It was a matter of which one of these is the funnest, Yeah, you know? If, if if there was a way that I could do all of them at the same time, I would. That's what I'd be doing right now, still. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, it was like a it was like a sampler. You were kind of just checking everything out, see what's up. Exactly. So I mean, I'm not 
excellent at any of those instruments. Yeah. But I can hold my own at all of them, right. you know? You're proficient. Yeah, uh, exactly. Because you played with uh, Cadillac Blindside, right? I did. I played drums. I played drums with them for maybe a year. Okay. You didn't play on any of the records, did you? No, I played on all the demos for the Read the Book, Seen the, Re- seen the Movie, you know? Right. Um, played on all the demos for that record. I helped arrange a couple songs. I think in my head, I feel like I helped arrange a couple songs. <laughs> but I joined that band right as my main band had broken up. The band I was in from ninth grade to after everybody split up and went to college. Okay. That band broke up. And in that six month span after that band broke up, I started rapping, started a band called Building Better Bombs, mm-hmm. joined Cadillac Blindside. Like I was just grasping to like <laughs> do something because my, my band had put so much time in and was breaking up. So that was the, that was the band that lasted you through high school. What was the name of that band? Ohm. Just OM. OM. Oh, just there's bit, kind of aggressive pop punk. He probably, is, I mean, there's no way you've heard of those. <laughs> well, no, no, but there, yeah, there. I know there's a stoner metal band that's called OM. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. It was, I mean, it was, it was pop punk based, mm-hmm. and then as we got better, we, you know, delved into like melodic hardcore and you know early stuff. Yeah. But Cadillac Blindside kind of got myself kicked out of that band by complaining about wanting to be harder edged and sounding too much like Get Up Kids, and you know, I was like, I really want to be more aggressive. I want to, yeah. So. I got a call from the guitar player, James, uh-huh. who is a good dude, and he's like, you know, you keep mentioning you want to be a hardcore band, and we found a drummer that's really into it. It was cool. I wasn't really bummed. Yeah, yeah. No, I never, I mean, in all the stories I've, you know, heard about it, it was never like, you know, oh, wow, this was a fucking terrible breakup. Was Ohm kind of the first sort of touring stuff you started to take yourself out with? Yeah, and we didn't get far, you know. Mm-hmm. We did, like, Chicago some shows in wisconsin you know like yeah. whatever we could drive to on a long weekend you know we were 14 15 right. so it was a matter of getting our parents to first take us seriously and then right let us do it you know right right i got the maximum rock and roll book your own fucking life and fucking work for it love it <laughs> <laughs> the early days of actually you know calling people and being like hey can we play this <laughs> And I remember on that tour, two or three of the shows fell through, and then we scrounged and went to record stores and found shows to get on those nights, you know? Yeah. I mean, the first tour I did was definitely, it was like, well, let's see, four weeks long and probably played like 10 shows. <laughs> and so it's yeah, like, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That sounds about right. And it was so cool how you could obviously do that, where it's like, you know, you did show up to, you know, Boston or like, oh man, like, there's a fucking Drowning Man show that night. Like, maybe maybe if we show up early enough, we can play, yep. like, first. And it happened. <laughs> For real. And so, like, as you were going through high school, was it one of those things where, um, you know, did you focus on your studies at all? Or was it one of those things you were just kind of like, I just want to get out of here oh, no. and experience the real I, world? I, I hated high school. Yeah. A combination of kids just hating high school, a lot of them anyway. Mm-hmm. And a black kid in a white school and having the obvious aggression toward me. Right. Like there was, there was a lot. I didn't like. I was very much looking forward to get out of getting out of there. And did you? I mean, did you experience like you know blatant sort of racism, or was it one of those things where it's like people were treated? Yeah. <laughs> from from both ways, you know. Yeah. Like white people thought I was a criminal, and black people thought I was crazy. Right. <laughs> like the whole the whole like. Yeah. Well, you were you were kind of uh, you were segmenting yourself, or you were like a niche of a niche, where it was like you know yeah obviously like you said white people are looking at you because you're like you're one of the only black dudes around here, and then yeah like you said black people were probably looking and be like, yo why does this guy have a mohawk? This is weird. <laughs> For real. <laughs> For real, absolutely. You were in the middle, and there there was no Pharrell back then to be like, oh, he's kind of like Pharrell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had no like common point to understand. And so, I mean, the 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 thing that I've always liked about hip hop in general, I think that I mean, obviously, you can completely agree with the statement that the parallels between you know punk rock and hip hop are they're the same thing, basically. They're exactly the same thing. It's just a different medium, you know? Right. One group has access to instruments, one doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. A lot of people aren't able to make that connection. They they think those worlds are so far removed. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's always been a lot. Of, I mean, nowadays it's way different. Nowadays everybody listens to everything. Right. But definitely back then, you, I mean, maybe it's like this in high school now, I don't know. Mm. But you kind of, if you're a music kid, you grab onto the style of music you listen to, and that's largely what your identity is. You know, it takes getting out of high school and getting away from people that you don't like to flesh out who the rest of who you are is sometimes. As you graduated high school, I presume you had no plans to pursue further uh, education <laughs> as far as that's concerned? Oh, no. No. I didn't graduate high school. I got kicked out. Oh, really? Um. I kind of bounced around a lot of 
alternative schools for the last couple of years of high school. Just because, like I said, like it's it's not that I wasn't smart, I wasn't crushing tests. I would, I would test really well. I just did not do any homework. Period. Right. You know, if it didn't seem interesting to me, if it seemed like busy work, I just wouldn't do it. Right. <laughs> so they put me in the school with the pregnant girls, and they put me in the school with the lazy kids and the you know semi-retarded people. Uh-huh. And the, you know, they're just trying. I, I I've just trying to do whatever. And then they put me back in my normal high school, and I realized that I wasn't supposed to be there either. And then when I was back in my normal high school, I stood on lockers and complained about inequality and promoted myself instead of going to prom and things like that. So I got kicked out. Right. They're like, you, uh, you shouldn't be speaking these views. Yeah. It's also just trying to get the peace in the school. Right. You know, we, we had giant posters that said, fuck prom punk rock. And we had a show on prom night where if you came dressed in prom clothes, mm-hmm. you got it for free. Oh, so good. <laughs> you know, so at, at an actual venue in town. So we got a lot of people there. It was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> but that was kind of the last straw. I got kicked out maybe two months before I would have graduated. And is, it, is it one of those things you look back on and you're like, that's a bummer. I wish that two weeks could have passed and I could have got the quote unquote piece of paper that made me, you know, a legit quote. Nah, it, it was, it was two months, not two weeks. Okay. But I, I didn't, I didn't really sweat it too much. Yeah. I was already playing shows. I was already, you know, getting paid for shows. You know, I didn't. I remember having a meeting with a guidance counselor, asking what kind of colleges I was going to go to and what I wanted to do, like for a living. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm already doing it, man. <laughs> what are you going to tell me? Like you hit on a, a totally important point that I think so many, so many kids in general don't realize that it's like a lot of kids look at high school and they feel that they're in like a suspended state of animation where it's like they can't, they can't do anything, you know, like their parents tell them to do these things and they like, they have no control, but it's like, they do have control in the sense of you can do shit that you like and start, like you said, you know, you're playing shows or whatever it is you're into. Like you could start now. You don't have to wait. And so many kids like don't, yeah. don't understand that concept. That's true. And then, and, and it could be, obviously it's like some people view that as threatening where like, you know, a guidance counselor, like meeting with you where it's like, wait, what do you mean? You're already doing something. Yeah. Your your other your other, I don't know. your other friends aren't. I don't know that anybody thought it was threat. I was never like a violent kid. I was never a mean kid. Okay. You know, so as far as like all the teachers liked me and enjoyed having me around. Right. You know? But and if it was a class where we got to discuss things or like tech, it was great. So I was never I was never bullying any anybody out mm-hmm. as far as that stuff. I just it was difficult to deal with probably. As they say, you didn't apply yourself. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it, it didn't seem like it meant anything to me. I definitely did not. Right, right. It was it was a pointless endeavor. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, as you were saying, so like obviously once Ohm was breaking up and you know Cadillac Blindside stuff was that falling apart from that perspective, um, that's when you obviously felt the need to express yourself via the vehicle you are doing currently. I mean, obviously hip hop was a part of your life, um, and that was a music that you enjoyed. Why? Why'd you make that that initial first step to be like, okay, this is the way I want to be viewed and express myself? Well, because I didn't want to have to deal with a band breaking up. Mm, okay, that was, that was that was pretty much it. Is it was the only thing that I could do by myself. Mm-hmm. You know that I that I was aware of. You didn't, you um, mean you didn't want to pick up an acoustic guitar and just just do that way? <laughs> no, that ne- has never in my life been an option. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'm sure it is an option to like. You know, write some ballads and play acoustic guitar. It's just never, it, it never occurred to me that it was a thing to do. I never even enjoyed music like that until Bon Iver. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like, there's there's some Elliott Smith jams I like, but you know, I had to like turn 28 <laughs> before I could deal with anything where right it's quiet. You know, so it was it was just well, yeah, it was it, a matter of of the fact that you could control this sort of on your own. Yeah, it, it was. I didn't know how beats work. I didn't know how anything like that worked. I just I knew how to rap from laughing with my cousins and laughing with some friends and mm-hmm. it was it was it was one of those things where Cadillac broke up and I started building motor bombs with Isaac. We later are currently still in a band, Marijuana Death Squad together. Okay. Which is my main other project aside from rapping. Right. You know, I called up the only rapper that I knew in town and I was like, Hey, are you still rapping? <laughs> and he had just happened to get some studio time already. So we went straight to the studio, wrote songs, uh-huh. and paid like three to five hundred dollars a beat off of this guy. And then by the by the time we were almost done with a record, I was like, "That's bullshit." Bought an NPC from my friend. Uh huh. Interesting. <laughs> like, 
I started I started rapping because I didn't want to have a band that was gonna break up. Yeah. And then I started making beats. I didn't want to pay for beats. Right. You know? <laughs> so it, it all is just like how it worked out. I think it, it's out of necessity. You're just like, okay, yeah. I don't want to do this, so I'm going to do this. That it, it's just that that's the best way to view things. Where it's like, oh shit, man, I don't want to pay. I'm gonna figure <laughs> I'm gonna figure this out how to do it on my own. It may suck for a while. It'll eventually get there. Yeah. I don't know if I ever thought about it sucking. I think I just didn't want to pay for beats. Right. You know, and learning to use an NPC was a, a huge musical step for me to take what I knew about guitars and other instruments mm -hmm. and apply it to a machine that was so easy to handle. Right. You know, it's still the way I think about music nowadays is based on hip hop style production. Sure, sure. Well, I, I always think, I mean, you can look at the people that obviously are extremely successful and, you know, obviously credible within hip hop. Like they have some multifaceted background it's not they're just like they're so singularly focused where it's like the only thing they've ever done is hip-hop because i just remember like uh, my own first personal experience with hearing you and what you did as far as pos is concerned was it just like i, I just remember people being like yo there's like this there's this hardcore kid that li lives up in the, the minnesota area and he's just like he raps about fugazi and you're just like <laughs> I, I just remember that, like, because that just didn't exist. Like, people weren't really expressing themselves the way that you were doing and then lacing in references to independent, you know, music culture. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't, there wasn't too much of that going on, for sure. Yeah. I don't, know if there's, I don't know if there's much of that going on now. No. There's more of it, for sure. Right. But, you know, in that kind of, like, genuine thinking about kind of ethics of of the underground punk rock scene and keeping that stuff in mind, you know? Right. I find you so interesting from that perspective where it's like, obviously you've retained all of the ethics that you've grown up with within that, you know, hardcore and punk scene, but I've obviously applied it yeah. to, <laughs> obviously applied it to a different scene. Honestly, each record of yours has progressively got more and more like it could have been put out on ebullition <laughs> in the nineties. Like, it, 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 I mean, just awesome. just yeah, from the from politics, politics of it and from the vibe. I appreciate that, man. That's that's you know that was one of my favorite labels growing up. That was that was one of the labels where that's, yeah, that's... I had stopped listening to the radio years ago, and in in in, in, in turn uh -huh. I was listening to ebullition or Blood of the Young. You know, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, Blood of the Young, exactly. The, the, right, right from your same That was a, a um, major yeah. influence in my life was that label and going to, you know, the 1021 house where all those bands would play and all the bands that were on tour would come to that house, you know, and seeing all these people who were maybe uh -huh. no more than like five, six years older than me just kind of welcomed me into their house was, was just a huge yeah yeah how do, like so how do people because i'm trying to put myself in the perspective of people that aren't familiar with what it is that you know you and i have grown up with so it's like you know a person that's just like randomly finding pos that has no context for where it is you're coming from but just like enjoy the music you're creating um like how do they interact with you is it one of those things where they're just like oh man like this guy's pretty edgy and like you know how how does that all sort of like you know lay itself out like you know direct and immediate feedback from people being like i had no idea this was happening politically but until i heard your song uh, i'm like, getting I'm sure a little bit of that, that but it's mostly um, younger people you know um and i don't know i don't know the context of how you know when it, i feel like when i was in, when when i was in junior high and high school i would find music mm -hmm. by if i liked the band i would go through the liner notes and find bands they liked and then go get those bands and find bands they liked and then go get those bands you know, whereas, whereas nowadays, if you hear right. about anything, you can just look it up on the internet and check it out. I, mm -hmm. I grew I grew up having like a deep, I cared so much about the music I was hearing. When people come up to me now and are talking about the ideas they hear in my songs as something new to them, exciting and strange, but I just assume that they're, you know, young. There's so many different entry points for people to be exposed to you know, something beyond just like, yo, your yeah. beats are sick or, you know, that guitar yeah. lick is sick and or none, whatever. None of the music I listened <laughs> um, to growing up was completely vacant of content. You know, like everything, everything I liked as a kid had, had something that I was taking from it. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like I was, I was never big into love songs. No. Was, you know, yeah. I like the Vandals cause they were funny. Right, right. But as it, aside, from, aside from that, like everything was, you know, somebody taking a stance on something and going, you know, I took Minecraft very seriously. <laughs> right, right. You know, 
and it wasn't, it wasn't until I got older and realized that everybody's just people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. I mean, yeah, you, you, you view those things as like the gospel. Like, I mean, yeah, totally. You know, I was actually just talking with Mike about this is like, you know, when we started Doom Tree, we got Doom Tree going, mm-hmm. all of us lived in the same house. You know, all of us lived in the same house because we thought that was what you were supposed to do. You know, I don't know if everybody did, but I assumed that everybody in Wu Tang saw each other every day, you know, and so probably good. lived in the same house. Right. You know, I just assumed that that's what it was, you know. Mm-hmm. And then you, you you grow up and you've been living by those kind of rules and you realize that, ah, oh, those dudes don't even really like each other. <laughs> like, <laughs> For sure. No. You know, you assume that what happens in the song is the gospel, is the real life, is what's going on. Yeah. You know. And then, at least in my case, I modeled my life off of the things I was inspired by in music. Right. I'm glad that you brought up, like, the idea of, like, collectives and, like, obviously within hip-hop, it goes in waves. But it's, like, as of right now, it's, like, collectives and crews. That's the thing. Obviously, Doomtree has existed for a long period of time and gone through the phase of, like, when crews weren't a thing. (laughs) Yeah. And crews crews and collectives, I think, are the coolest coolest part about music. uh Uh-huh. You know, whether it's the way the circle of musicians I spend the most time with in Minneapolis work together, we all have our bands and our projects, but a lot of us are just kind of making things. You know, we make a project together and see what happens and collaborate, you know? Right. And I feel like that's that's a that's a great way of going about it. It makes the whole city feel kind of like a collective. Well, no, I mean, that, I mean, it's completely exemplary of, like, obviously what you've done musically from P.O.S. and you know, Wharf Rats, where it's like, <laughs> yeah. you're just like, yeah, I'll do this. Sure. Why not? That was one of the funnest parts of the summer. Right. That year. <laughs> um, but I, I like that view where it's just like, you know, the music community as a whole, it, you know, you just want to bring it closer to you. You want to make it smaller in a positive way. I remember seeing you, because uh, I'm sure this was a very unique experience for you, seeing you, let's see, Warp Tour, I want to say 2009 or whenever you did the tour. Um, yeah, I did it a couple times. Yeah. Okay. I can't remember. I think I saw like the Irvine date or whatever. I just remember, it, you know, kids like, first of all, like just walking by you and not understanding what it was that you were doing, but then they would check you out. And then by the end of the set, it would just be like, you know, kids was like, fuck yeah. Like I, I'm totally on board yeah. with this dude. Was that like the experience overall or was it, were there definitely. That was, I've done work tour what, like uh, three times, you know, uh, what I did a couple of weeks, I did the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I think I've been out there three different years and every single time, every single time I have that experience where every single day I play a song, it goes okay. There's mm-hmm. maybe 25 people there who are POS fans. Everybody else of my fans are not going to buy a ticket to work for. I spend my half hour earning a crowd by people who are walking by. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, it worked out incredibly well. Sometimes it didn't work. But for the most part, I had a pretty positive experience out there every time. It was funny to play to, like, a starting crowd of, like, 25 people and then end with maybe 200 people every day and then get to Minneapolis and have a starting crowd of, like, you know, a 1,000 and have all the the crew and staff be like, whoa, who is this guy? Right. Yeah. Well, that's definitely more meaningful when it's, like, you're you're literally earning the crowd minute by minute. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that's awesome well i'm glad you had a good experience because i you know i know i mean the warp tour is such a it's such a grind like it's such a it is it is such a grind but it's it's also you know i i think that one of the reasons why i i mean i feel like i'm a pretty good live performer and i feel like a lot of the skill i got as a live performer was doing that tour so many times you know right i mean the first the very first time i did that tour was in 2004 i was selling merch for atmosphere and kind of when I got the job selling merch, he was like, you know, this is a grinding tour and a lot of people leave it every day. So bring a set because you might be able to work out some shows for yourself. And uh, That's I incredible. did. I got shows starting like day two. I had a show every day pretty much. <laughs> That's incredible. And, and it was, you know, I mean, you go, to a, you go to a stage where there are bands trying to, you know, follow this tour and drive, you know, in, in a car. This is a, this is a bus tour meaning you go to sleep and you wake up in the morning and you're at the place, right? Right. But there are bands every year that play their set at 4 o'clock and start driving their 14-hour drive so they can be there the next day, you know? Because right. that's, that's just how the tour is laid out. Right. Being on a bus with Atmosphere gave me kind of an advantage. I could go to every stage manager and say, hey, 
I can fill up a 15 minute or a half hour slot with five minutes notice every day, anytime. So here's my number, you know? Yeah. And that, that was pretty much that. That's awesome. That's a, a, I mean, that, yeah, that experience is totally, you know, it, it, it can, like you said, it can totally spit, you know, chew them up and spit them out, or you can obviously take it and, you know, learn from it and hone your craft, which obviously that's what oh, you absolutely. did. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of bands that last two years that go on to work for and feel like rock stars for a summer. Right. And then go on to real estate or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Totally, totally. Um, the one thing that I've always uh, found about, you know, kind of the sort of independent hip hop when, when I started to hear the term, like, you know, backpack hip hop thrown around, yeah. <laughs> it, like, I don't know if that strikes you as derogatory, but to me, that was always just like, I mean, it, I, it, to me, I found it like cute. I was like, Oh, that's a cute, like, I see what they're talking about. That's cute. Uh, do, yeah. when you heard that term, was it just like, Oh really? Is this what it is now? Nah, nah. By the time I was actually in the door with hip hop, it, it was emo rap was coming around. That's true. You know, emo and, rap. And, I, and, I, and I was just really bummed out about that. I never really was bothered by the backpacker thing because all of us had backpacks. Right. <laughs> You're like, we literally are backpack hip hop. Yeah, we literally have our notebook and our favorite music on us at all times. Right. You know? <laughs> and some markers so you could write some graffiti. There, there's definitely like a, a truth to that statement of a style, you know. Right, right. Like this is this isn't some stereotype. This is based in reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, there are some people that would take that in a derogatory way, but you know, when I got into hip hop. I really took it there, you know. Yeah, I didn't yeah. take it there like I bought a backpack, but I definitely took the backpack I was already wearing and filled it up with all of my hip hop essentials. Right, right. You're like, yo, I'm I'm ready to go on tour. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I got my mic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> should I plug it into? Totally. Show, show me where to go. I got you. Um, the uh, with your most recent record, I was. I mean, I bought it. I bought the picture disc and was <laughs> so stoked to see the Crime Think booklet. Like, yeah. It, it was just uh, like, do people, you know, do people give you feedback on that where it's just like, oh, wow, like this is cool that you included that or um, obviously it was just important to you to do that. Like, you know, I, it was, it was really important to me to do that. Um, and I reached out to Crime Think and, I, you know, I've been a fan forever, mm -hmm. um, but I really liked the workbook. So I reached out to them about it and they were just as into it as I was. So it was just a matter of, you know, uh, making it the right move for the label and making everything work. Right, right. Yeah, no, I just... But yeah, I have I have got some feedback, especially when the record was, was brand new. People definitely reached out and told me they were being introduced to Crime Pick for the first time and really happy and being introduced to the idea of, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, that, that style of anarchy for the first time. No, for sure. Because it's totally... It's one of those things where it's like you... I mean, just like, a you know, you're like you said, when you're looking at bands, thank you lists, like once you open the door to that and you're just like, Holy shit, they got books. And like, Oh my God, like there's, there's this whole culture I was not aware of before. That's what I'm saying. And that's what I was trying to do with this record is I really wanted to, you know, it's time for digital music. And I, I, you know, that's how I feel about it. Every time I put out a record, I want the physical package to be something cool that people can actually be excited that they have. And that's what, just cause all my favorite records are the same way. Right. Right. Yeah. That they can interact with it on a, you know a deeper level like on a physical tangible level yeah yeah absolutely. and i loved uh, i love the fact like when i remember when you released that first uh just little sort of introductory video of uh you know the song when when that justin vernon sang with you oh yeah and it was just like <laughs> i loved your explanation it was just like yeah i just I, I called him up and he said yeah i want to do it i'm sure there are people that watch that and were just like oh fuck you there's no way like you know, just what a what a Grammy! Like, there's no goddamn way. And then, I mean, for a person like you know, from where I'm coming from, where it's just like, oh no, I know why they're connected, and like, yeah, it makes sense. Of course, they're friends. Like, why would they not want to yeah. do stuff on each other's records? And like, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, this is this is uh, between the Gangs record and between uh, Marilyn Death Squads, and yeah, this this is a, a person I see all the time. <laughs> it's not like. I gotta find his manager and all that stuff. You know, I <laughs> right. eat lunch. I eat, eat lunch at his manager's house all the time because we're friends. You know, like it's not like, uh, yeah, it's it's not like I gotta find the Grammy guy. Right. You know? This is this is a it's, strategic business move. Nah, for real. Man. It's, it's just some Midwest man. Yeah, yeah. It's easy. No, for sure. Um, 
the uh, there's something that I've been thinking about a lot recently that um, I would like to get your take on just because it's uh, especially with what we've grown up with as far as just being, um, you know, politically aware and, you know, whatever (laughs) animal rights, environmental rights, like all this stuff, um, you know, and we're of both of roughly the same age and we both have children and there's all these things where it's like, you know, it gets to a point where it's like, it's almost, uh, it's almost too much to take in where it's just like you get, I, I mean, I didn't coin this term, but like compassion fatigue where, you, you get you get to a point where you're just like you know like i'm literally doing everything i fucking can like in my own life <laughs> and like you know how does that how how will that trickle out and how will that impact other people um and so yeah i, I mean i'm sure you've kind of gone through those same you know thought processes and stuff like that yeah definitely I, especially you know i'm on i'm on twitter and you know i don't want to talk about such such obviousness obviousness as the, the 24 hour cycle of everything all the time right but yeah there is definitely a bombardment of feeling <laughs> yeah. it's uh it's tricky i think i don't i don't know that i let it get to me you know you I just think push that, on yeah you gotta you gotta yeah. there's a there's a huge underlying culture you know of people who don't care about anything <laughs> right and that's, well it's it, all right knowing knowing that I care about anything at all, and I work on anything at all, and I dedicate anywhere at all in my life. Yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm I'm doing what I can. Right. You know, and anytime I have the the urge or the ability to do more, you know, d- depending on where I'm at, health wise, life wise, I'll do it. Right. You it, know, but it, that that just being so full of rage at the people who are doing nothing has to go away at some point. Yeah. No, for sure, and it. That, it's it is cool though it's like when you do um either see a person that's putting out something that you agree with or it's like philosophically in line with what you're doing where it's like you know it it makes you feel less alone where it's just like oh it really does i'm not the only dude fucking caring about this shit (laughs) yeah and i guess i was hoping when when i put that crime think book in the record i was picturing you know a 15 year old buying this rap record and and getting into crime thinking, mm-hmm. you know, like that's that that's what was on my head. I wasn't thinking about my peer group. I wasn't thinking about even really most people my age as much as I was just thinking about teenagers, man. Yeah, teenagers. <laughs> I, in in my opinion, they need that shit. They need they need to have something like literally blow their head open, where it's like, yeah, what what where is this? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and everybody thinks that they know everything because they know it's so big. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's so much. There's so much that you know. We're we're both in our early thirties. We, I'm sure, both of us still feel the same way in regards to like. There's so much shit that I learn every day that I didn't know before. Yeah. That it's like absolutely oh unbelievable. And sort of uh, the you know, two last little things I wanted to hit on was like one, obviously, like your your health was a very big issue last year that you made it public and you know people spoke to you yeah. a lot about it. Where are you at currently with it? It's still, still a big deal. I'm doing dialysis every day. I'm actually setting up dialysis stuff right now. And uh, I'm waiting on a kidney transplant. But honestly, like, dialysis works. People do this with their life. Mm-hmm. And though I'm really happy that I don't have to do it with my whole life, um, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm up and moving. I'm That's back good. in the studio. I'm getting things done. I'm trying to, anyway. Um, there, there was a few months where I couldn't really do anything but sit around in my bed feel tired feel upset right so, but it's kind of turning around the outreach from fans and uh, the support i've gotten has been uh kind of monumental yeah in my, in my life well i'm sure especially during those times where you know that were probably the darkest where it was like holy fuck i can't even function right yeah i was, I was having a pretty hard time for a long time and i was couldn't keep my eyes open and you know a million things mm-hmm. like i said it's, it's all it's all kind of coming around. That's great. Well, I'm glad to hear that because, yeah, that's definitely. I got, I got some shows booked. I got to 